Hello and welcome to the Fret Dojo podcast. My name is Greg O'Rourke. In this episode, Ryan and Vin had the great privilege of talking to the legendary jazz guitarist and educator, Mr. Rodney Jones. Rodney's played with a who's who in the music world from Dizzy Gillespie to James Brown. He's also recorded with the biggest names in music, played in the house band of long-running television shows, and taught from the prestigious halls of the Juilliard School of Music. Rodney also has an amazing wealth of stories, tips, lessons and insights that are guaranteed to inform and inspire any student of the guitar, from practicing and performing tips to real world advice that will get you consistently hired for professional gigs, so listen out for that. After the podcast, head on over to fretdojo.com and consider joining our community as a member, where we have a wealth of jazz guitar courses, song lessons and other resources available to you, such as masterclasses with top jazz guitar educators in the world. In fact, Rodney Jones himself will be joining us for a live masterclass on April the 11th, 2024. I'm really looking forward to that one and I hope you can join us. So enough with that said, enjoy the podcast with the jazz guitarist extraordinaire, Rodney Jones. Hold your applause. Right. Bravo. Yeah. I don't know about that. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to think of a better introduction than that. Uh, but that you're hearing our special guest, Rodney Jones, today on the Fret Dojo podcast. Rodney, how are you doing? I'm doing amazing, incredible, fantastic. Awesome. I'm here with Vin as well. And I, of course, my, my name is Ryan. Before we get into it, I'll just read a quick, quick bio about our guest today. Uh, Rodney Jones was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and started playing guitar at the age of six. At the age of 20, he joined Dizzy Gillespie's group and started a career performing and recording with a who's who of music, including James Brown, Lena Horne, Quincy Jones, Christian McBride, Stevie Wonder, Elvin Jones, Kenny Burrell, Stan Getz, and countless others. Rodney was the house guitarist for the Apollo Theater for nine years and the staff guitarist for the Rosie O'Donnell Show for six years. He also has 13 CDs out as a band leader and is the owner of New Tide Music and JazzGuitarScholars.com. He's taught at the foremost music schools in the United States, including Juilliard and the Manhattan School of Music, and has led jazz workshops and masterclasses worldwide. He's also the author of Hip Guitar Lines, A Gateway into Learning and Applying Advanced Jazz Vocabulary on the Guitar, published by Mel Bay. George Benson says, Rodney Jones is a legend among musicians, especially guitarists. He's worthy of the ears of any music listeners. We are very pleased to welcome Mr. Rodney Jones to the Fret Dojo podcast. I'm glad to be here. Everything you shared was really humbling, I, but I joined Dizzy when I was 19, just turning 19. Oh, 19. <laughs> uh, even better, even better. Curse the producer. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So starting guitar at the age of six, you know, do you have any kind of specific, you know, musical memory of, of what got you into starting on the instrument or with music sure. in general? Yeah, my, my father was uh, working at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, he got he gave me a little toy guitar, like it really wasn't a real guitar, it was just a little toy thing, but I used to strum on it and stuff like that. And he had always wanted to learn guitar for real. And when we left, my father moved to New York, uh, his students gave him a real guitar. I believe it was a Goya or something like that, but it was a real guitar. And uh, that's when I started really trying to play. And I, I learned tunes like, you know, day tripper and you know hard days of night and that kind of stuff you know any tune that begins with i figured it was good i'm good you know and uh i, to, I tried to play day tripper all on one string i didn't really realize was... <laughs> i was like man that is that guy is incredible and then, you, and then one day i was like i was like oh man you know uh, 
So, but that was really the beginning of it. And I took some folk guitar lessons, playing like this land is your land, that kind of stuff. I got pretty good at folk guitar. So good, in fact, that I ended up playing rhythm guitar for Pete Seeger, the folk mm. guitarist, if you know. So I ended up playing with him. Like I was like, you know, 10, 11, 12. I was playing <laughs> rhythm guitar for Pete Seeger at, you know, concerts around uh, New York. And then I discovered in my early teens, Jimi Hendrix. And man, that turned into a whole world of excitement. I mean, I'd learned Cry of Love and Rainbow Bridge and Electric Ladyland and on and on, learned all the solos and tried to look that part. I had the giant afro and, you know, was totally trying to, to be that guy. My, you know, my, my parents were like, what happened to our son? Like, we went from PC to like, who is this guy? Jimmy and moved in the house. What happened? You know? And, um, and then I was listening to the radio one day and I heard something that was like, like a, Well, it was Barney Kessel playing some version of Summertime. Mm. And I I took up my car. I said, oh, that's great. Let me play that. And it was like... You know, this did, did not... You know, yeah. It wasn't the same thing. I was like, well, I can't do that. So so I began to, you know, try to learn to play jazz. I, I've had three main teachers in my life. The first teacher I had was a, a Haitian guitar player named Alex Pasquale. He's still alive. Um, and he, he taught me sort of like, you know, here's the Dorian mode and that kind of stuff. It wasn't really jazz. He played finger style, so it was more Charlie Bird, but he was teaching me modes and scales, and I found that extremely boring. Um, the second teacher I had was Dizzy Gillespie's guitar player at the time, a guy named Al Gaffa, who actually showed me, the first line he ever showed me was... <laughs> And I wore that out on every, I didn't care what, major, minor, diminished, I played that line because that was the line I knew how to play, you know. And uh, then I had, uh, then the moment of, you know, of destiny happened. I, I uh, met a guy in a music store named Bruce Johnson, who was a professional guitar player, was playing with Gil Evans, the writer, and touring Europe with different groups and things. And he played left-handed, and I was in a music store, and I was trying a, an SG, and he said, give me that guitar. And he took the guitar and played it upside down, and was like... <laughs> I was like, oh my God, like, I felt like I'd been struck by lightning or something, you know. So I said, man, do you teach? He said, sure, I'm going to Europe for a few months, but I'll call you when I get back. Give me your number. So, you know, months go by, I hear nothing. Then one, one day I'm home, like, you know, oh man, you know, still going, you know, still running that in the ground, you know. And he calls, hey man, it's Bruce, I'm back in town. I said, cool. He said, come over now. I was like, okay. He said, and bring a beer with you. <laughs> so, so it's like, and that began really my, my real, um, he was a masterful guitar player. He was a genius, a real Thelonious Monk on the guitar tape of genius. Harmony, uh, great facility. You know, he played with everybody around New York. He, he was very eccentric, so he never really achieved a lot of wide recognition. But he was a masterful teacher. He taught myself. He taught Bobby Broom. Bobby Broom was studying wow. with him at the same time. Ed Cherry was studying with him at the same time. Kevin mm. Eubanks was studying with him at the same time. <laughs> you know, he was like, you know, he was like the guy. Kenny Burrell knew him, you know, it was like amazing. And and uh, he said, look, if you stick with me, I, I think I was 16, he said, you'll get it together. So after two years of playing with him, I joined Chico Hamilton's group. I was able to play professionally. And uh, after playing with Chico Hamilton, my first professional gig in 1975, um, then Dizzy Gillespie offered me the chance to play with him. And that was it. The rest is my story. <laughs> Why a story? I thought I read, um, and I could have had this wrong. Did you attend the uh, the City College of New York as well? I did. I, I was going to City College while playing with Chico, you know, trying to balance both. And Dizzy Gillespie, that's how I met Dizzy. Dizzy was a guest artist with the college band. And uh, after the concert, Dizzy, you know, I played some solos as part of the college band, and Dizzy came up and he said, man, you sound really good. Would you like to join my band? Well, I mean, that's like, is the Pope Catholic? I was like, <laughs> I was like you know. So I asked John Lewis from the Modern Jazz Quartet, who was the, the head of the program. I said, I said, Professor Lewis, Dizzy Gillespie just asked me to join his band. What should I do? And John Lewis said, under no circumstances, you join Dizzy Gillespie's band and go on the road, period. 
Then I went home and I asked my dad, who was a, who was a, a Christian minister, you know, I said, Dad, you know, Dizzy Gillespie has asked me to go on the road with him. Should I join his band? And my father's like, under no circumstances should you go on the road with Dizzy Gillespie. And I went in my room and I sat on the bed and I thought this thought. Would I learn more about jazz from the people who teach it or the guy that invented it? And that was the only, th only question I asked myself. And when I did the math, I was like, this is the guy that invented everything I want to play. I would be crazy. Like, school's going to be there. Everything else is going to be there. This is a once in a lifetime. And I, I was like, I'm, no matter what anyone says. So against the advice of my college professor and my dad, I joined Dizzy's group. And the rest is, you know, Dizzy became the greatest teacher. And um, in terms of jazz, uh, aside from Bruce Johnson, the sec second greatest influencer of my concept and what I learned. He was a, a genius and was very kind to a young guy. You know, it, it, he let me get into enough mischief to have fun, but he also kept tabs on me to, you know, to make sure I was learning properly. And, and, uh, he never really showed me a lot of things, but he, he showed a lot of things by example. He showed me what, what it was to strive for excellence. And he practiced every day still. And he showed me what it was to hold an audience and to play songs with feeling and, you know, all the lessons that I have tried to teach all my students to this day. It, I learned it from, you know, Dizzy watching him and observing what he did. You know, all he asked of me was that I show up and give hundred percent every night. And so he wasn't as concerned about how great it was, but that I gave the best effort I could. But here's an important lesson for students since this is Fred Dojo, right? <laughs> this is something really important. The reason Dizzy hired me was not because I was the world's greatest soloist. It's because when I comped, it felt good. Nobody wants to play with you on guitar if you don't feel good to play with. So it was great that I soloed, and that was great, and I played what I could. But the thing Dizzy liked was when I played chords behind him, it felt good for him. So mm -hmm. that was the thing. He was comfortable. I made him sound good. If I played my solo, it was great or not great, it was, it was okay. Anyone that's interested can go on YouTube and see countless videos of me with Dizzy. They're all over the internet of me playing with Dizzy at 19 with giant hair and, you know, <laughs> I, but I can tell you that, you know, I played a Guild X 500 most of that time and I wore really nice suits and had really big hair and the ladies liked that. And the ladies <laughs> that. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> There's always that little extra perk. That's not why we do it, of course. <laughs> well, that's why I was going to play guitar. You know, when I was, when I started playing with, with Bruce, studying with Bruce, after about six months, he said, you know, Rodney, you're really good. You could probably play professionally if you wanted. And I was really interested in being a limnologist. No one knows what that is, but I knew. A limnologist is a person who studies ponds and inland streams, freshwater ecosystems, small style, not, not rivers, not oceans, only ponds and streams. I was obsessed with that, turtles and that kind of, and Bruce was like, limnologist, like, giant question mark, what are you even talking about? I said, you know. Frogs and turtles, and he Bruce said this did out to imagine to a 15, 16 year old boy. He said, "Let me ask you a question, Rodney. Do you think you'll get more girls with a turtle <laughs> or a guitar?" And I was like, "Let's see, turtle guitar, turtle guitar." I was like, "You know what? I think this jazz thing is going to work out." You know, to a 15 year old, the hormones are yeah. just starting up. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? But it, but I could understand. He spoke the language that I could understand. He's like, "Girls." turtle or guitar i was like yeah that's i get that i, I can understand that you know so that was a, a defining moment you know i I'm, I'm curious about you know talking about kind of taking that step and, and leaving school to go be with dizzy you know you talked about it a little bit because you maybe explain kind of how that influenced your approach to being uh kind of in that same position of teaching in those institutions um you know, having well, had that more sure. experiential musical upbringing. Sure. I mean, the, the thing is that in terms of education at any university, it really comes down to the teacher and their knowledge base and experience. You know, what they know to share, because they may not know themselves. They may ac be academically trained exclusively. And so they teach from that orientation. And it's not nothing wrong with that. There's just a lot more to be learned. You know, there's word lessons and then there's world lessons. And I always focus on world lessons, the stuff I learned on the bandstand, the stuff, you know, I, I learned the things I valued, you know, was uh, not playing every note, you know, that was right in the scale, but playing the notes that meant something. And the notes that meant something to me. Dizzy never let me play stuff. 
If I was playing, I had to believe it. I had to mean it. You know, which is different than okay. Here's the here are the modes of the you know major scale, and you can use these or these chords. That's good. But at the end of the day, each student, each musician has to say, well, out of all those things, what are the things I actually feel? What does it mean to me? What do I want to play? And it's so so school is good if you get both approaches. If you don't hear someone tell you that, you know, I always say if you want to play music, you should practice music. If you want to play exercises, you should practice exercises because we're going to do what we practice most. All humans beings do. So if you if you practice scales and exercises and patterns and then get on a bandstand or go to a jam session and wonder why you're not killing it, <laughs> you know, that's why. If you're practicing mm -hmm. music, but not, you know, if you're practicing licks and patterns, but not ever learning the underlying structure, then you're limiting in that way too. So you know, the sweet spot is to have the parts of jazz that are caught as well as the parts of jazz that are taught and do both of those things and combine those. And that really depends on the guidance of a teacher. This is something that I... You know, I've talked a lot about, um, and I think something that separates me from many, many teachers is that I knew from an early age, even before Dizzy, that I wanted to be a teacher. Even though I could play, I never identified as a player. I always thought I'm a teacher who could play, not a player who can teach. And so, so many guitar players and musicians teach because it's a thing, you know, it provides health insurance and it provides stable stability and it's a way of earning a living in a, in a shifting economy. And I get all that. Nothing wrong with that. But their calling is to be a musician. Their calling is to play their instrument and play to tell their story and do gigs. My calling is to help students. You know, my calling is to teach students. Even though I can play at a, at a high level and play with the best of them, I identify as the teacher who can play well. I, don't, I never feel like I'm Rodney Jones' guitar. I always feel like I'm Rodney Jones' guitar teacher. Who can, but incidentally can play. And that's a different thing. <laughs> can I jump ahead just a little bit? Because this is this is an, an area that we don't get to talk to too to, uh, too many people about because they don't have the experience. Um, you spent many years uh, both um, on the Rosie O'Donnell show as the house guitarist, right, and also uh, Showtime at the Apollo. Yeah. Can you tell us like um, how do gigs like that differ than from say performing your own sure. concerts? What skill sets would you know you need like? stronger sight reading i would imagine yeah you are imagining correctly um the the thing with that gig is and it's something that that music not everybody's interested in this, this aspect of the music but for me i was always interested in the craft of music as well as the art of music so i like playing different styles you know i related to jimmy hendrix as much as i related to john coltrane and i like the craft of playing a part perfectly and beautifully and so reading it well, and I like the craft of playing different styles and, you know, playing it convincingly and country guitar. I liked all these things, which was a craft because I wasn't really doing that for art's sake, but I was doing that because I enjoyed the experience. I enjoyed the music and I enjoyed the craftsmanship of doing it. Like someone who, who a carpenter who can build anything, you know, the person says, well, can you build a box? And he's a luthier, but he says, yeah, I can build a box. And he builds the box. It was that kind of stuff, you know, um, that's, so that's the first part. So there's the craft versus the art of music. And I enjoyed the craft of music. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I recognized early on that um, a lot of the gifts that music gave me weren't, wasn't about the music. It was about the people I would meet and friends and, and experiences. And so I recognized that in the professional world of doing, you know, I've done many, many Broadway shows. And I was a guitar player on the Cosby show, you know. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, you know, and on the, the, the Celebrity Apprentice. Sorry. Um, you know, but I did those, you know, I did those kind of, and I wrote TV commercials and played on countless records. I played on records with Willie Nelson and Trish Yearwood and, you know, um, Ray Charles and, and uh, you know, Billy Joel and on and on and on. Um, and that required skill. You know, it required a skill. It wasn't always the music I liked the most, but it was something I didn't not like it because the studio guys that, that played that way were like their degree of excellence and like intonation and inflection was all perfect. You know, the artistic choices maybe wasn't the best thing, but if you give them some music and say, play this, they're going to play the crap out of it. I used to work a lot with, um, be hired a lot by Phil Ramone, if you know that name. As oh, a, yeah. as a great, he used to hire me all the time. He was like my patron saint of, of sessions. You know, and I asked him one day, I was like, you know, I'd be in the session with all the top studio guys in New York and me who can read pretty good and play, but I'm basically a jazz funk guy, 
you know, who played with James Brown and Maceo, and I like played that and could play jazz with Dizzy. And, but these are guys who, you know, you know, they're the guys on the Mariah Carey records on the Whitney Houston record who play, you know, it's perfect, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and I said, like, Phil, why are you hiring me? He said, because you make it soulful. You bring the you bring the truth to it. You play what's real. You're not playing. It's not perfectly, you know, crafted to be perfection. You play authentic. You play the blue notes. You play the things that make it feel. So when you add that into the mix, and I was like, really? He said, yeah, it's kind of like what Cornell Dupree and Eric Gale used to do in the 70s before me on all the sessions they would do. Like they would hire Eric Gale and Eric Gale could read and play, but he would always play something bluesy and, and added a little funk thing to it. And <laughs> Cornell Dupree would always add sort of like a, a blues, chicken scratch, you know, something. It, it was just out of tune enough to be good, you know? And uh, so I, I was like, thank you, I guess. And uh, so, yeah, so that was the thing. So I got to do a lot of sessions because, and also because I could play like, I could play like, And none of these other guys that are playing, you know, could have any idea what, what this is about. <laughs> you know, and I could also play. I like that that type of sound, too. And and uh, so that served me really well, you know. And I, I know I made lots of friends and, you know, got to play with, you know, everybody. Madonna and, and uh, Barry Manilow and Bonnie Raitt and... Um, Chaka Khan and the Indigo Girls and Meatloaf and Davey, the Monkees. I got my fancy. I got to. I got to play this. Uh, with the Monkees, you know. I, I mean, I got to play that with the Monkees, you know, and um, you know. So it was amazing when I when I got when I played with James Brown. That was the first time. Like my sister, she's like, "You're really good." Like you let me get this straight. Like the dizzy thing and like. All the other Kenny Garrett, none of that, that did that didn't matter. But the James Brown, if I go, <laughs> yeah. oh man, that's, I was like, man, I, and all my friends were like, man, you're really good, because I played with James Brown. Like well, the rest of my career didn't matter, you know. So, but I got to play with everybody. You know, John Denver, Al, Al Green, um, Stevie Wonder, you name it, I played with them all. You know. Do you feel like there's any kind of one, um, or you know, maybe not one, but. Uh, you talked about your, you know, your appreciation of craft. Do you think that's kind of the main thing that allowed you to, you know, fit into all those scenarios? Or, you know, what do you think allowed you to be successful? Um, in a nutshell, not being a weirdo. Mm. I'm not kidding. Like, being able to have the social skill. No one wants to be around someone they're uncomfortable with they don't like. I don't care how good you play. No one's going to rehire you or hire you to work consistently if you're a creep and can't function, and particularly in TV where you got celebrities and people around, and you're if you're weirded out or act, can't separate your personal life from your professional life, you're not going to last. And I was always to do you know I'm all every situation I'm always thinking how can I make the music better, what makes people comfortable. I I don't have any issue with anyone, you know I don't care who you love, how you love, the color of your skin, how, what you like. I don't none of that matters to me. I'm interested, are you a real, warm-blooded, genuine person who values love and, and beauty and music? If you do, then we're family. If you don't, then I don't really have anything to do. But, you know, for TV, you know, you you know, you know suck it up and you, you know, you have to smile. The camera's on. You got to, you know, I, my mouth was frozen and, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, but I did that show for six years, you know. And, uh, you know, and I did, like I said, I did the Apollo for nine years. So that was a different skill set. You got to know how to how to, you know, fit in. I played, I was on Lauren Hill's first performance ever, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I played with all the groups of the day and, and you know, all the funksters because I, I grew up playing funk and all this is where the, all the James Brown stuff, you know, came in hand and all the Jimi Hendrix came in hand because I could use pedals and they could play different sounds and play a Strat and, you know, all that. Um, it, you know, it's really interesting when I played with James Brown the first time, you know, when I, as a, as a kid, 15 teenager playing James Brown's music, you know, James Brown usually had two guitar players. He either had, you know, uh, you know, Catfish Collins or Jimmy Nolan or, you know, whoever he had in the band. And, um, but I didn't know that because I'd never seen him. So I learned both parts, you know, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> not 
not realizing that one guy was going, and the other guy's going. So when I played with James, and it was, I was the only guitar player on, on the, the first gig, and I was naturally playing like both parts of all the tunes. And so I heard James, after the rehearsal, I heard James say to his manager, said, yeah, Mr. Babbitt, uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to hire him. We're going to use him on the road because we only need one guitar player. We can save a whole bunch of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say. You know, but that was true. <laughs> so not, not, being, not being like unable to, I mean, how I am, you see me now, this is how I am. Mm. But I also know when to not talk. And I know yeah. when to be quiet. I know when to leave the room when people are talking when it doesn't involve me. I know when to be there. But I'm always trying to be helpful. If I can fix something, but this like a if there's a note wrong, I'm not gonna be like, hey, you know, do you want the D flat? If I know it's a D, I just change it. I fix it, I make it right. The bass is playing the wrong note, I go, hey, hey dude, you might want to play D. And people really value it. You know, if they you have someone in the band that you know is, is out to make you sound better. That's invaluable. And who's not, you know, a, a jazz musician who can be on time, who's not weird, <laughs> who's, art, who's relatively articulate, who will be dressed appropriately, who doesn't bring any baggage to the studio, you know. I mean, that's that's really what it is, you know. You're always, you know, something I've emphasized with students, you know, with teachers, like you're always marketing yourself every time you're seen including by teachers, yeah. particularly by teachers, because they're the ones that write recommendation letters for you for <laughs> higher education and whatever else you want to do. I had a student ask me in Juilliard, he's like, oh, Professor Jones, uh, would you might me, write me a letter of recommendation? I said, sure. I'm happy to do that. Do you want me to tell the truth? He had been a total screw up in class. I said, do you want me to, do you want me to tell the truth? And he was like, oh, man, no. I said, that's I probably shouldn't write it then, you know. Because my word is... What gives me credibility is I tell the truth. If I think you're great, I'm going to say it. If you're not, I'm not going to knock you, but I'm just not going to say, you know, what it is. Like, you know, like on the categories when you fill out those things, it says like, you know, how would you rate them compared to other students? And, you know, what percentage of students you ever taught? And, you know, if you don't want me to tell the truth about that, you know, so I'm always interested in the students that are willing to do the work that are willing to invest in their own excellence. Um, and those students I'm willing to, you know, to give my heart and soul to help them get there. And the students that aren't, you know, bottom line is, you know, with students, you can goof around for four years and struggle the rest of your life, or you can bust your butt for four years and have a career in music the rest of your life. Your choice. Early on <laughs> yeah, time, on time is late. That's class one. Yeah. Statement one to students. Early on <laughs> time, on time is late. Because yeah, like the Rosie show, totally. for example, we rehearsed at 7 a.m. every day for six years. It didn't mean show up at 7. It didn't mean get dressed at 7. It didn't mean tune up at 7. It meant at 7, because it's TV time and everything's timed out to the second. It meant at 7 o'clock, you're strumming the first tune, whatever it is. doesn't mean read it for the first time. You better be prepared. You better know what you got to do at 7 o'clock. So when students would come in at, like, you know, the classes at 2 o'clock and they're walking in at 2 o'clock, I'm like, I could be here at 2. I'm ready to go. So if you can't, you're telling me that your time is more valuable than mine and that you're busier than me. In which case you should be teaching the class. Why don't you go apply to the, go down and see the dean and apply for a faculty position right now? And they're like, oh man. And so after a while, you know, they would not do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I've asked a few others. You know, we've had some recent, um, you know, hot, very high level um, educators, and I like to ask this. Uh, it's not that's not the last No, no, no. <laughs> Is there any particular? Um, like subject or f or uh, part of playing guitar that you kind of wish um, your students were a little bit more prepared before they came to see you. Like perhaps they were, and now this is just a general statement. Of course, there are always yeah. going to be people who are I, stars, I mean, who are who are like better sight readers. Do you wish that they had worked a little bit more on their repertoire before they came to see you at university? I mean, the acceptance rate of Julia was like you know. 5%. Well, sure. So, you know, of students, so 100 students apply, five five get called back for re-audition, maybe two would be accepted, it's that kind of thing. So, okay. Um, so, you know, you have to know, and Manhattan School of Music was not, was marginally better, but not a lot better. Um, you know, the thing is, you have to ask yourself, you know, the thing that matters, you have to be, you don't have to be an incredible reader, but you've got to be a functional reader because you can't function in academia and playing in ensembles and big bands if you can't read the music. So you're going to hold everybody back if you can't read the part. And, you know, every ensemble, students are writing 
you know, sometimes with two days in between or so it's not, you're not going to get a chance to re rehearse everything and get a rehearsing ensemble. If you can't get through a functional rehearsal, it's not going to work out well for you. You know, it's just not going to, it's not going to happen. Um, the fundamentals, you know, it, it, can you play a blues? And then if you really want to have a chance to get in, can you play the blues, which is different? Playing a blues means you know the form and can play the patterns and play the right things. Playing the blues means I can sit there and feel something, even in your audition. If you can play the blues, now you've connected to your heart. And I said, oh, this is a guy who understands that very important thing about jazz. Like, you're actually telling the truth, your truth, versus, well, I know the blues scale. I know the pentatonic, and I can put it like that. <laughs> I mean, that's great. But, um, you know, to be able to play a blues is different than playing the blues. And the basic form, you know, can you play a minor blues? Can you play a 32-bar standard tune? Can you play, you know, tunes that are vamp tunes? Can you play... Uh, a bossa nova type of thing. Can you play something that's free jazz, which means it sounds so bad no one wants to pay to hear it? You know, but a lot of music, I've seen musicians who did very well at Juilliard and they didn't get accepted. And I'm like, what happened? They said, well, he came after the after the audition, which he did well, you know, or she did well, they go to the interview and say, well, why do you want to come to Juilliard? And they'd be like, well, you know, I've always really wanted to be in New York. New York is a place where music, you know, jazz is. A... I was like, dude, what were you thinking? When they say, why do you want to be in New York? He said, going to Juilliard is my dream. Are you you're using Juilliard as an Airbnb to be in New York? That's not going to work for you. <laughs> That's not going to happen. And you'd be amazed. A, a number of students dig, didn't get in because that part of the audition, they were let it known that, well, I'm just going to school so I can be in New York. And Juilliard's not that place. There are other schools to go for that. Juilliard is like, you got to give it all because Juilliard is the Navy SEALs of, of music school. <laughs> yeah. Juilliard is no joke. You, you, you know, once you get in there, it is no joke. You, you, you're in it. And, and so you've got to be prepared for that. You know, if, if you were the best person in your town, believe me, you go to Juilliard, you're one of the worst at the school. Uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit, I, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, so back in 2022, uh, I was really fortunate to catch it on live stream, but there was um, that really great Pat Martino celebration of life, um, which was just such, such an awesome program. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that experience and, and kind of being in that position with all those other great players? Yeah, I, I mean, whenever I'm around great guitar players, that's a that's a good day. You know, those are all all those guys can play, and all of them guys have their you know all those guys have the thing that they do and the way that they play, and and uh, it's beautiful um, to be around them. I, I think Jonathan Kreisberg and Paul Ballenbach and Mark Whitfield and Dave Stryker and Barry Green and I'm sure I'm forgetting some some people, but whoever else was up there. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was great. It was a lot of camaraderie. It was more fun behind the scenes than it was on stage. On stage, it was cool. But behind <laughs> the scenes, it was a lot of, like, you know, fret brotherhood. No, you know, yeah. depending. So, I mean, some people can be weird and competitive, and but I don't do weird. So I, it doesn't matter to me. Like, you know, I don't... When someone else is great, it doesn't make me smaller. It inspires me to be greater. You know, that's mm. how I take greatness. So you're great, then that's... I want you to be great, because then I want to be great, too. Not your great, yeah. so I shrink away. I don't. I'm not in that zone, and I don't have anything to prove. And most of those guys, you know, by and large, did not have anything to prove. And, and everybody had their own st style and sound. I mean, Pat Martino is not a huge influence on me. I was much more influenced by Wes Montgomery and George Benson and and that sort of school of guitar playing, Grant Green and Barney Kessel, than than Pat Martino. Mm -hmm. Having said that, Pat is one of the you know the the great masters of the guitar in jazz to ever play it. You know his. He had his own sound. He had his thing that he did. He did it to the nth degree, you know, um, and he was a clear master of the instrument. So I, I loved tributing Pat Martino because he's he's a real master to, you know, I just posted something on Facebook today, you know, with my a picture of myself and Gene Bertoncini and Tony Matola. I mean, Tony Matola is one of the greatest guitar, I'm not talking straight ahead jazz guys, but for just like mastery of the guitar, we're all trying to be Tony Matola, all of us. You know, Gene Bertoncini for like beautiful chord melody arrangements. I'm not talking like improvising, being the world's greatest bebop soloist, but for like working out some beautiful chords and harmonies and execution. Come on, that's like, a, that's, you know, you celebrate excellence in all its forms and everybody has something they can do. Everybody has something that's, you know, I love John Schofield, I love Peter Bursley, I love Bobby Broom, I love Henry Johnson, you know, I love Tal Farlow, I love George Benson. Like, 
It's not about color. It's not about playing one style or the other. It's about celebrating the diversity and the excellence and then finding your own voice. Like, what do you do in the midst of all that? You know, what do you, what about me makes me me? And then discovering that and then being willing to commit to that. So, um, so no, I loved it. I loved it being a part of that. I was grateful to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, I mean, Pat Martino certainly was worthy of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's really beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you were telling us before we uh, started the podcast, you have a new release coming out, the Infinity of Things. Can you tell us a little something about that? I, I can. In, uh, in 2017, I injured my index finger. I cut the ligament in my first finger and the vein in my hand. How I did it was irrelevant. I, was, I did it from stupidity, unpacking a box with a knife cutter and all that. was... We don't need to go into it, but <laughs> suffice to say, I couldn't play guitar at all. My finger was completely jello. Um, I was going to get surgery, and then my four-year-old granddaughter died suddenly. Oh. Uh... And that was my, my daughter and her husband's only child. And so I went into save my family mode. My finger didn't matter. I didn't give a crap about playing jazz guitar. I had to save them in any way I could which meant spending time, effort, support, whatever I had to do, because you lose your four-year-old daughter and that's the love of your life and your only child, you you don't want to live. And I understood that, but I not only lost my grandchild, my daughter was at stake. So I didn't care, I didn't, you know, I didn't care about my, my hand at all. Um, interesting enough, my daughter was best friends with John Schofield's daughter and to the memorial service, John Schofield came. Really? Um, to that and I'll tell you about why I love John Schofield so much what what a beautiful soul this guy is and you which people don't know this part of him um, but anyway so I waited you know three or four months to get my surgery because I didn't care about my hands I didn't care I, I couldn't play and I, I didn't care so when I went to the surgeon he's like well you you know the longer you wait the tendon shrinks and the less likelihood we can repair we may have to take tendon out of your your hip or some of your leg or something like that and I said well what about playing guitar he said I can guarantee you'll be able to open doors and jars. He said, any more than that, it's unknown. I don't know. And so, you know, after my surgery, um, you know, my hand was in a, in a bandage for a month or two, and then I, I could, you know, it's still stiff. It's not perfect, you know, but I um, began to just play one note at a time and, and you know, try to get the strength in it. And... Um, after a little less than a year later, I could play pretty good again. I worked myself back by, by the discipline of you know coming to this very room from five to eight in the morning every morning, and doing the, the equivalent of long tones on a on a trumpet with my first finger just to build strength. And the beginning was like, and then after a couple of weeks I could I could get that. Then I could try to play chords build the strength so I could you know so anyway it was a long journey but after about almost a year I could I could play again um, so as part of that therapy the continuing once I could play again I use that as a time to reset I said you know since I almost couldn't play at all and since I see the fragility of life through what I just went through I'm not gonna waste any more time playing stuff I don't really want to play and practicing things I don't really believe in and and doing stuff just to do it I'm not gonna do that anymore because it could all be gone. Uh, you know, that's what I learned. If a four-year-old can go, I can go. Anybody could go. So I was like, I'm going to make sure that every time I pick up this guitar, it counts. And I really play what I believe and it matters. So I would come down here and play like, you know, hours and hours and not stop. And, you know, because I was building strength, but I also had to build endurance, which means reps. So I would play one tune. I have the world's record. I played, I'll remember April, for an hour and 59 minutes. I was going for two hours. But my wife needed to go to Costco. And in the middle of, like, the last minute, one before, one fifty nine, she said, Honey, when are we going to Costco? And I'm like, Oh, man. Oh, I hate my life right now, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know. But I did do one fifty nine. But um, but it's part of my practice. You know, I'm very much in love with um, the John Coltrane 60s impressions, you know, one up, one down, really go in on the music, like, not so guitaristic, but really play it, lean into that. So I began to play long extended solos, not repeating myself, finding my own language. I found language that had never been played on the guitar before, stuff that has never been done before, 
fingerings and and techniques that have never been used before. When you hear the Xfinity, the Xfinity, the infinity of things, you'll hear what you haven't heard before. To my knowledge, I've never, I don't know of any other guitar recording of one tune of 54 minutes, and I don't know anyone playing the vocabulary that I'm playing in that recording. No one. I mean, so much so that George Benson called me and said, can you send me some recording of you playing those new theories? And I was like, boy, what, that's the ultimate compliment. If George Benson is saying he likes, <laughs> he hears something special in what you're doing, can you share it? And of course I did. I mean, it's an honor. And, and you know, you know, in his hands, forget it. I'm obsolete. If he decides to play it, it's over. You'll never, hear, you'll never hear from me again. I'll just be a, you know, attention Costco shopper. You know, I'll be that guy. You know? But because uh, he's the great grandmaster, other than Kenny Burrell, who's the great, great, great red belt grandmaster. You know, I also. Play the um, so, um, so I began that process. The ex the infinity of things is my exploration on one tune of minor blues for 54 minutes without repeating myself. Um, it, you know, I, I record everything when I'm practicing and it was just one of those days what the recorder was on and I was in a zone. And after I did it, I realized like, wait a minute, that was pretty good. I listened back. I was like, I think I captured it. I think that was, mm. that was the, oh, oh, you, that's the statement of what those years of work did of where I am now. And this, I think I recorded that maybe December 2nd or so. So it's still pretty fresh, you know, it's very fresh. And, I, you know, it's, I mean, it's not like a multi-track, beautifully recorded. I'm playing the bass on it. I play bass as well. So I played the bass and I used Drum Genius and played drums on it, you know. Mm. And, uh, but when I listen back to it and I played it for a couple of students, they're like, OMG, you know. So I sent it out to all my colleagues and I got like glowing reviews from like, you know, nothing like this has ever been on the guitar before. And this is, you know, I mean, from people like Mark Whitfield and Miles Okazaki and, you know, Dave Stryker and Peter Bernstein and all, you know, they are all like, this is, you know, evolutionary on the guitar in terms of what has been done. So I said, well, maybe I'm on to something. So I decided to, to put it up. Well, fantastic. Well, uh, with that set up, I think everyone's probably more than a little eager to hear something. So let's play just a little bit. We don't have the 54 minutes, unfortunately. Uh, this is the Infinity of Things. <laughs> Thank you. 
wow, so there's really some incredible material there that wow. you can hear. That was the infinity of things, Rodney Jones. Just wrapping up here, Rodney, you mentioned to us something about your guitar before we started. Uh, could, you, could you kind of share that with our audience? Sure. I have, uh, you know, at my guitar peak, I had 51. You know, I set in a TV studio and a recording studio, I set at home and I set at school where I'm teaching. So I had all these different guitars and, you know, and, and my wife was like, you know, it's them or me. And I'm like, don't make me choose. Oh, no. <laughs> don't make me choose. <laughs> you know, uh, my, my greatest fear in life is that when I die, she'll find the receipts for what I actually paid for the person. That I told <laughs> but anyway, that's anyway, another, another story. I won't be around to know, but that's, that's like, oh, man. She's going to be like, what? Uh, he said that was five hundred dollars, not five thousand dollars. What? <laughs> um, uh, but I, I have the guitars I use primarily for the jazz work I do. I have a Benedetto Bambino, which is a thin line, kind of like a George Benson thinness guitar. It's 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 beautiful. I mean, it's like it's my go-to that I use everywhere. Low on feedback, great tone diversity, um, flexible. I use that with the GT one hundred pedal. I can make it sound like anything from a Strat to a an L5, you know, so I use that. I have a Benedetto uh, 16B, which is their, I think their most practical professional grade guitar. It's a, uh, you know, it's, it's a masterwork. I mean, it's a handmade, handcrafted, top of the line professional jazz guitar. If you're gonna buy one in your life, you can buy that and you're, you're good for the rest of your life. And that's, that's for, I can use that for any kind of jazz, you know, it's good for, I would say, after quartet. Beyond that, you know, because of feedback and it's it's light, I don't want to get into that too much with that, uh, but it's beautiful. And then this is a brand new D'Angelico. I've been had a relationship with D'Angelico for a number of years now. And in terms of, like, you know, uh, mass-produced instruments, I don't think there's anything comparable. You know, I, I've had other brands, but I found this to be the best playing, best sounding. So they came out with an EXL1, and I demonstrated it on their website, actually. You can see the video up there. Uh, but what made this exciting, this is an EXL1 with a built-in humbucking pickup. And so it essentially plays like an L5, but it's not an L5. But, like, immediately, as soon as I held it, I was like, okay, this is this is the one. So it, it plays like a dream. I mean, it literally, you know, you know, it makes me want to, like, do things I shouldn't do on camera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it makes you want to do this kind of thing. Like, is he caressing his guitar? Like, what's going on? Like, what? Is, I know he loves guitar, but what's that about? I'll be with you in a minute, honey. You know, it's like that kind of you know. So it really plays beautifully, you know, and it sounds beautiful. It, you know, it has a... asking me about the fact that I'm playing with my thumb like that. No one, I, even, I just no one even went there, but that's cool. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can only fit so much of the time, but man, it, you know, I know I'll be going back and listening through for all the wisdom you shared. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. It was such a great conversation. Well, it, you know, anytime there's a chance to, uh, you're, you're welcome. I think anytime there's a chance to, um, you know, to make a difference in the lives of someone that wants to to, to do music, you know, because music is something, the person doing it, you're asking someone to exchange time of their life for time of, for you playing. And you can get more money, you get more everything, but you don't get more time. So I think if you're going to ask someone for your, for their time to listen to you, you got to offer something, some real food. You don't want to give them junk food. You want to give them something that really means something. If it means something to you, it'll mean something to them. So anything that furthers that objective, I think helps the overall group consciousness of musicians. And, and then it helps the, 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 you know, the listeners. I think people don't care about perfection, but people care about truth. They care about, they care about authenticity. At least people that are listening to jazz, not people in politics. People that are listening to, you know, to jazz care about, you know, can I feel something? My mother, when she would go to church, sometimes she'd come home and say, I didn't get fed. And what she was saying to the minister, it, it might have been an elegant message, but there was nothing that spoke to her soul, nothing that spoke to her heart that, it made her feel like she got something of value. And so I think when a musician plays, when I play, I always want to leave the audience 
with something, not just so they learn something about how I feel, but something that helps them discover more how they feel. You know, and so a lot of times I play what I want to hear, not only what I want to say. If I put myself in the audience and I'm playing what I want to hear, I make different choices. It feels some things feel good to play, but they don't feel good to hear over and over. <laughs> but so and so, you know, so it's it's striking that balance. But I I appreciate what you guys are doing. I mean, it's an important service. You know, it's a podcast, and you know, it, it's it's one of you know, God knows how many things of, uh, about music that are available online. But you know what? It's not an important. If you're that kid like me with the guitar and the turtle, if you're that kid that tunes in and hears this and it's like, oh, yeah, you know, practice music, play music, play ex practice exercise. Like if that becomes something that sends them down a road of musicianship or excellence, then our job is well done, you know, then what we've done is important. And I, so I think I'm always playing for the one person who, who's hearing and you guys, you know, ask really intelligent questions, thoughtful and and uh, you know, clearly love the music, and so it's a, it's my privilege and honor to be here. I'm I'm, I'm grateful to you for having me. So. Well, excellent, thank you. And and I, I just want to say that you had my friend Beth Marlis on here. Yes. And, and you know, Beth is an educator of the highest order. She's a beautiful player and like just a fine human being. I call her my little sister. <laughs> and uh, so the fact that she's on here, she I, was fantastic, you know, fantastic. She she gave Lots me the wisdom. thumbs up on. She gave me the thumbs up on you guys. I was like, yeah, I don't. She's like, no, no, no. These are the good guys. Do it. Oh, like, <laughs> terrific. How can uh, how can people follow you and find you? You have the website? Yeah, you mean other than the bill collectors, you mean? How can... Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I'll give you a fake social. Turtles. How can you find you? <laughs> I'll yes. give you a fake social number and a fake ID <laughs> uh, and a P.O. box address. Um, so my email address, which is easy to remember, is jazz. My, the, the courses, I have nine courses that I've, that I've taught. They're, it's called Jazz Guitar Scholars. Jazz guitar and the word scholars, all one all one word, jazz guitar scholars at gmail.com. That's it. Jazz guitar scholars at gmail.com. And they once they reach out to me there, I can send them to where to find out more information. You know, all I have a, a number of courses, you know, like one is uh it's called Tune World, which is an exploration of like 14 tunes. I have Tune World 2, which is another 14. Guest artists, my guest exploring these tunes. There's nothing like it in the internet. You know, I had as guests Peter Bernstein, Kevin Eubanks, um, Frank Potenza, um, Chico Pinero, um, Bobby Broom, Ed Cherry, Dave Stryker, Henry Johnson, um, Calvin Keyes, Mike Jackson, um, and so many, I can't even think of all the people, but basically the who's who of jazz guitar elite because I thought it was a valuable, when would students have a chance to hear me and that person talking about how they explored and how we explored. So like Peter and I discussed alone together and he's like, you know, I was like, well, Pete, you know, a lot of times I'm playing, you know, like I might play, but it might be all over. He's like, oh, I never thought of that. It's like, well, I go, you know, I wouldn't play G7 there. It's like, yeah, but if you play G7 there, then you can play F augmented. You know, <laughs> stuff that the student wouldn't know to ask about. But it's it's invaluable for students to hear that kind of high-level dialogue between professionals discussing the process. And so I did that with, like, I think 30 different things, and it's all part of the course. Once you sign up for the course, you not only get 28 lessons, you get 28 master classes from some of the greatest players in the world on the, on the 28 tunes. Rhythm Changes, Giant Steps, Minor Blues, you know, Stella by Starlight, My Shining Hour, Green Dolphin Street, on and on and on and on. So it's really the it's really a life's work. I think it's some of the best work I've ever done. And um, you know, it's also a community. I mean, there, I think there's 128 students in that particular course and they post back and forth and play their versions of stuff and I comment and they comment and it's really a it's really family. And then I every couple of weeks I do a Zoom call, a live Zoom. I got a live Zoom call tonight, for example, and and uh, I say, "Okay, so you're working on this. What what are your questions? What's going on? And you know, here's what I'm working on. I gave him like the last class. I gave him my new the line of the week. This off F minor. I'll play an E minor for you. So. But I use the I use the uh, freeze pedal, so I'll go. What else could you play that on, and how do you pick that? And 
What's the application of that? And what if you play it in triplets? And what if you start on the downbeat or on the... You know, it's, it's real guitar geekdom. But if you love jazz guitar and are interested, if you're intermediate and above, you're in, you're in guitar heaven. It's guitar Armageddon. Mm. <laughs> well, terrific. That was fantastic. I'm sure uh, a lot of our viewers are going to be watching this one a couple of times. You gave us a lot to chew on, lots of gems of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Namaste. My pleasure. And there we have it, the fabulous Rodney Jones, who will be joining us for a live workshop on April the 11th, 2024, in the Fret Dojo Academy. If you're keen to join us for that workshop and ask Rodney your own questions, as well as having access to jazz guitar courses, song lessons, live guitar classes, and more master classes with other top instructors, head to fretdojo.com. That'll do it for this episode of the Fret Dojo podcast. Make sure that you give this episode a like if you enjoyed what you heard today and subscribe to the channel to get informed when our next fabulous interviews happen and other jazz guitar lessons and all that good stuff. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. My name is Greg O'Rourke and have a great day.